Good evening and uh, thank you for joining us on today's installment of the Nation Leadership Forum. My name is Dibala Lainer and on behalf of the entire team, I bid you welcome. Just as a quick primer today, we are discussing the impact of COVID-19 and the family. Now, according to a recent UN Women's Statement, the existing crisis of the violence against women and girls is likely to worsen in the context of COVID-19. Emerging data shows that since the outbreak reports of violence against women, and particularly domestic violence, have increased in several countries as security, health, and money worries create tensions and strains accentuated by cramped and confined livings. Now, conditions of lockdown have also exacerbated the whole scenario. Chief Justice David Maraga recently, through a press briefing, confirmed that Kenya is experiencing a spike in sexual offenses, constituting 35.8% of recorded cases since the virus reached the country. The prevalence of gender-based violence is already at alarming levels in Kenya, with violence against women now normalized in large sections of the population. Almost half of women aged between 18 and 49 have experienced some form of gender-based violence, including sexual harassment, domestic violence, rape and defilement, among others. While it is estimated that Kenya loses 46 billion shillings per year in productivity due to gender-based violence, the impact of rape, child marriage, female genital mutilation and wife battery on individual women and girls who experience these heinous forms of violence cannot be imagined. And the abiding question remains, what does this worrisome statistics portend for the family? Well, I have a good fortune this evening of hosting a formidable panel that will help me broach this subject, Professor Margaret Kobe the Cabinet Secretary, Public Service, Youth and Gender. Also, we have Jacqueline Mutere, founder and director of Grace Agenda. Also, Alan Maleche, just the two of us. We can make it if we try. He's the only gentleman today on the panel, so it makes the two of us as well to drive a show. He is the executive director of Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network, that is Kellen. And also we do have Marcy Shege, Director of Programs and Strategy Plan International Kenya, of course stepping in for uh, Ket, who is a country uh, director. So you get to drive a show with me as well. Remember the hashtag is Nation Leadership Forum. Also you can tag us on NTV Kenya. Also follow me up on uh, my Twitter handle, which is at Dibal Ainer. And just to put also this host into a full run, we'll begin with the cabinet secretary just to give us the current state of play. And let me just begin with you, Professor. The National Helpline 1195 registered an increase in gender based violence uh, cases in March, the month when we know dusk to dawn curfew commenced, with 115 cases. This is up from 86 in February an increase of 33.72% in just three weeks. Just give us, what is the current, the current state of play as far as uh, these statistics ask, are concerned as we speak? Thank you very much, Edival. And I think countries or governments around over are, are, are struggling with this crisis of uh, coronavirus. And uh, we, when this happened in Kenya, the government, of course, led by his excellence, the president, because this is a leadership program, uh, put a plan for Kenya so that we can uh, have responses to the coronavirus. And uh, those uh, measures that are coming from the Ministry of uh, uh, Health, we wash hands with the soap, we uh, social distancing, and we stay at home, and we wear masks. Uh, some of the plan that the government has put in place. Within that plan, it has a structure. And this structure is uh, about four committees that are every day dealing with what is the structure, what are the resources, what we need to do. Uh, it is as a result of um, the, 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 some of the good intended uh, measures that we have started seeing there are some unforeseen or unintended outcome. What this means, especially in the gender-based violence, uh, I would say this is not a really new gender-based violence that has always been there, and governments and the State Department of Gender, everybody works around how to prevent gender-based violence. But now with the situation we are finding ourselves in, we have realized that uh, in Kenya it has increased by over 30%. 
But uh, when you look even at the UN Secretary General, he was the very first to sound an alarm that uh, gender-based violence has increased. And what that means, it has a very negative impact on family. You know families are the main, the, the center of every community. Therefore, when there is increased violence in the home, where we are supposed to be fighting safety, then government is also very, very concerned. Therefore, right now, what we are doing as um, State Department of Gender, we have the helpline 1195, which is 24-7, so that anybody who experiences this gender-based violence, and let me also say what gender-based violence is all about, anybody who is harmed or attacked, either physically, emotionally, just because of the, their male or men, that's what we call gender-based violence. Therefore, when it happens at home, then I think uh, the whole family is destabilized. And again, uh, the, the children who grow in the environment that there is um, violence, they also end up accepting violence at the later age. So the value can see uh, the, 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 the violence that is going out around the home is really affecting, is an intended outcome. It is affecting the effort that the governments have put in place. Therefore, I, I think it's very, it's good to say that there are causes. The causes are when we find ourselves confined in the, in the homes and there were already existing conflicts or the relationships were never good. We find those are the families that are suffering more. We also find during the time of crisis, gender-based violences was increases. Why does it increase? Especially when there is no food and the livelihood is affected. Then you find that uh, they, they experience some stress and uh, when people are stressed, both men and the women, then you can see the, we find a situation where there is more increased violence. Let me also say violence is not just for women, it is also for men. But we know uh, from our helpline, 90% of reported cases are from women and uh, about 10 are from men. And I think especially when um, the stereotypes where men are supposed to provide for home and then they lose a job, then they find a hostile uh, environment at home and uh, maybe women also have become very a bit overworked because children at home, everybody is at home, they are, uh, and the pain work has increased. So under that stress situation, we find that uh, gender-based violence has increased. Thank you. So uh, at a later stage, maybe I should be able to tell you what is government put in place to ensure that the gender-based violence is checked so that families are, are, are not ruined because the strength of any uh, country is the strength of the families that they have. Fair enough, fair enough. And of course, we shall be also uh, getting back to you to just also drill deeper on the issue of uh, economic uh, uh, a prevalence that uh, now we know the pandemic course is really affecting the economy and how does it also potent for uh, the family unit as well but I still want to hang on on uh, that dedicated line uh, and I want to open uh, right now Alan Maleche who's the executive director of Kellen from your own estimation uh, is the available re response mechanism adequate right given that we just have 1195 which is uh, the uh, gender-based uh, of course, hotline. Do we need other types of diversified support uh, and reporting mechanism that will be exceedingly beneficial at this critical time? Uh, thank you, Debal, for having me on the show. You're welcome. I just want to begin to put the show into context by uh, reflecting on the fact that we have over 5,000 people in Kariobangi who have been forcefully evicted from their homes. And we have single mothers and children who have nowhere to go. So in a context of COVID, we definitely need to use a rights-based approach 
to ensure that we cover all bases. It's good that the government has put in place a toll-free number. And now what is important is to ensure that the toll-free number services and the people who support it uh, are fully resourced. However, the 11, the toll number only from government is not sufficient uh, because uh, you must also work closely with civil society organizations and community-based organizations as those are more closer and central to the people and the people have more trust in that system than the government. So we need to find a way to be able to complement both ways of using both the government system and the system that exists for civil society and communities. We have worked with partners including uh, Transparency International, Katiba Institute, CRU, uh, ICJ Kenya, uh, to set up our own toll-free numbers and emails uh, to be able to complement what the government is doing. And equally, our partner FIDA Kenya has a toll-free number that's providing legal aid and counseling services would like to see more support to such organizations, even at the community level, to be able to deliver. Over to you, Debal. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Alan. Because uh, we, we've noted that the civil society, the faith-based organization also, the community-based organization as well as parachurch ministries have expressed frustrations that, you know, there is no uh, participation of uh, these groups, which is very critical at this particular time. And... Uh, the question will be again, how then is it pivotal for the, these societies and the groups as well, the NGOs, to participate in the design of COVID-19 uh, response? Alan. Sorry, say, I, I didn't, could you say that again, the ball? I didn't get you. Yeah, the question I'm asking, uh, let me cross over now to uh, just uh, give you a bit of a break and I cross over to uh, Masi Shege with that particular question. Masi, how critical is the participation of uh, civil society, faith-based organization, and uh, also parachurch ministries as well in the designing of COVID-19 responses? Masi. Thank you very much, Ron, and I'm, I'm happy to be here today. I think it is in, in a situation like this one, it is so important that everybody has the space to contribute the little that they can, because the government alone would get overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. For for the past several years, we have seen very active community-based organizations, uh, national NGOs, and also international NGOs, really complementing what the government has done and uh, is doing, and there's a lot of space for that. But in the COVID-19 response, I have felt like there's a restricted space, maybe because of the nature of the pandemic and the government wants to be very careful, but the space is not as open as we have been in the other, in the other, in the other situations. But I must say that uh, for Plan International, I think we have found our space and we are really grateful, and especially in the area of WASH, in the area of uh, protecting children and girls, we have felt that we have been able to participate. But it is important that the space is more open because this is a crisis that is affecting everyone and uh, the government needs all the support that they can. We cannot expect the government to provide uh, all the hand washing stations, all the detergents for fumigation and uh, in, in the urban areas and also in the rural areas, in all the public spaces. That may not may not be possible. We do not expect that the government would be able to make sure that all the children, all the young girls and the young women who are very vulnerable at this time would be probably protected the way they need to be protected. So yeah, I agree that the 1195 is busier than ever and I think they are doing a fantastic job. And for us in the child protection sector, we also know that uh, the toll-free line for children 116 is also working, totally overwhelmed, but they are doing the best that they can and we have seen a lot of support and uh, referrals that are going on from those two lines. But I think there's more space for more partners to come in. And I know the church 
churches have set up their own um, their own toll free lines. Uh, some some of them have even the paid lines where people can call, can call and uh, get counselling. And uh, the referral uh, pathways are also a bit open. But what I feel right now is a bit of uh, everybody is trying to do the best that they can, and therefore it's a bit. Um, uncoordinated especially when we have uh, the, the toll free lines and it is important for everyone to know who is providing support where because then this becomes uh, important uh, people so that people can spread out not crowd in one place where we are imagining that's where the, the, the support is needed so it is important that we are all coordinated and the best person to coordinate uh, co to coordinate us is the government and open up the spaces so that more toll free lines can come up and more even the paid lines because some people can pay they just need someone to talk to so the space is there but i think in the covid response it's a bit restricted i would have to say that Right, it's a bit restricted, and of course, uh, I hope also the CS is taking a mental note of that. We shall come back to it uh, much, much later. But before we take a short break, I want also to rope in uh, Jacqueline Mutero, who's the founder of Grace Agenda, to also just give us uh, her introductory remarks and to tell us uh, this particular space right now, you also, as a person and a champion who has been supporting women and girls who survive uh, sexual violence in Kenya, especially uh, since the 2007 post-election violence that we went through that harrowing torture as a country, but women you know, the border brand of much of that violence then. How has this particular uh, pandemic, as we speak, does it give you a deja vu of what really happened in 2007? Of course, the dynamics are different, but the, the challenges of women and girls are the same. Jacqueline? Good evening, um, Duval. Thank you for inviting me um, this evening. I thank you for the platform. And indeed, it does give me a sense of deja vu because it's really a crisis just similar to what happened in 2007 and 2008. And as I'm, as I'm reflecting and listening to what colleagues are saying, it just it, um, it takes me back to what inspired me to start Grace Agenda is that um, there is no humanity left in the whole approach, that all these things begin, we, 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 human beings end up as statistics. You yourself started your introduction by saying that um, um, citing the UN women's uh, statistics. Um, Madam Kobia has also talked about statistics. Uh, um, Alan has talked about statistics, and so has Madam uh, Mercy. So it, I, I, it, it, it's a bit painful that everything boils down to the fact that you're a statistic. So the part of humanity actually is very, is lost. And the, hum the hu humanity part is the last part in the food chain. And that is what I'm really focused on. Because after you've become a statistic, after you have been supported through through the process, after you have gone to the police, after you have gotten medical attention, after you have gone to court, then what? What happens to you thereafter? Do you, are you the same human being that you were prior to the violation? Do you become a better person? Do you become a worse person? Do you become a bitter person? Or do you become somebody who is able to actually um, support your, your, your country given the processes that you have gone through? And so um, I'm reflecting again that it's just the same crisis. We're still in the same crisis mode. We're still in the same fumbling um, uh, mode, uh, trying to coordinate activities. And, and apart from even government being the singular factor that should be, uh, to, should be coordinating us, they are coordinating, but they should also be supporting. Because there's so many community-based organizations that have got numbers that are in direct contact with what is happening on the ground, but they would rather they deal with bigger organizations that are able to perhaps give them bigger bigger numbers or maybe perhaps more, for lack of a better word, more professional numbers. And so the small fry are left out. They're, they're left out in the uh, of the um, they left off the table, and therefore it becomes just um, uh, a matter of people pushing around statistics on the table and about doing what what we're going to do, what we're not going to do. We've just talked. You've just uh, mentioned the hotline, the 1195, that is working. There's so many other hotlines and so many other services that are working. But I'm wondering if all of them combined came together. Um, are they actually adding value to the lives of these women and these children that are being violated? Are they adding value, or are they are they just getting statistics for the uh, for, for for purposes of justifying that this was a government intervention? And I'll leave it there just for now. Thank you. Right. Many thanks indeed, uh, Jacqueline. And of course, we will uh, broach that matter also on the other side of the break. We want to take a short break right now. Remember, you're watching the Leadership Forum. And uh, of course, the subject matter today is impact of COVID-19 on the family. And we're picking our thoughts on th three thematic areas. That is uh, gender-based violence. Also, we shall be talking and looking deeply on uh, child protection 
and also the family dynamics as well. So when we circle back, we continue with more. But we'll get granular on the gender-based violence. And remember, also, you get to drive a show with me. You can hit me on Twitter, uh, where I shall also be sampling some of your questions and also some of your comments as well. For now, we take a short break. Don't go away. Much more coming up on the other side of a break. The Ministry of Health advises all returnees from abroad to self-quarantine for at least 14 days, whether they feel well or unwell. Wash your hands regularly following the eight steps of hand washing. Wet hands with warm water, apply a small amount of soap, rub palms together, rub fingers and thumbs and the beads in between. Rub nails on palms, rub the back of each hand, rinse with clean running water, and dry thoroughly with a clean dry towel. Furthermore, it is advisable to cover your mouth and nose adequately when sneezing or coughing and immediately dispose of the tissue in a dustbin. Please do not use handkerchiefs if you can avoid it. If disposable tissue is unavailable, cough into your elbow. Try and avoid close contact with anyone showing signs of respiratory illness such as coughing or sneezing. Before you share any coronavirus information on social media, please verify it with Ministry of Health to avoid panic and alarm among your fellow Kenyans. Selena! Toto, where is mommy? Today's a toilet day. What? Oh, oh. <gasps> Selena! Toilet day? Tomorrow we're hosting a party and it's a matter of my reputation. It's a toilet. Not a white shirt. Even if you spend your entire day cleaning with bleach and detergent, it still won't be party ready. Impossible. Challenge. Happy 10X. Even if you use bleach and detergent 10 times, they won't give you the same sparkling clean toilet that Happy 10X will give you. Wow! Happy 10X. Happy, Kenya's number one toilet cleaner. <laughs> when is our turn to eat, sis? <laughs> well, I think so. One is a money of 100 million, 60 million. I can acquire administration. Next administration, so I'll let my guy see you select come a leader. Yeah. Some of our audience members are members, are fans of the ODM party. Okay. Now, as one of them has expressed, they miss tear gas. Ah, okay. <laughs> you know, I was a very unique kind of student. I was good in arts and I was very good in sciences. Your flexibility, ya kusomea hizo vitu zote. Si mugawie magavana wengine at least. The risk of illness causing jumps is increasing. It is believed that the coronavirus can remain on surfaces in your home for up to nine days. Touching infected surfaces is one of the ways in which jumps spread. Regularly disinfect your floors, countertops, and kitchen surfaces with bleach. And use an effective toilet cleaner inside and outside your toilet bowl. This message is brought to you by Medifacts, Jig, and Hapik. Are we not inviting? We have gifts! Valeria! <laughs> Mommy, best! Run or die! <laughs> Party! Compared to Nordmi Spray, Morty and Doom Power Guard kills disease causing pests instantly. Morty and Doom Power Guard. Dettol's main objective is to help children protect themselves from diseases. Do you know how we get illnesses like diarrhea, cough, and cold? No! They are spread through germs on your hands. Your hands collect germs that causes diseases. You pick up germs from any surface, like when you don't wash your hands after going to the toilet while playing. And then you can get sick because of germs. That's why you need to fight germs to stay healthy by washing your hands regularly with Dettol soap that gives the best germ protection ever against many illness causing germs. Wash, wash, wash your hands. What you have to do is bath, bath, bath yourself. Dettol soap every day. Wash, wash, wash your hands.
impact of COVID-19 on the family is a subject at hand this evening. And we are, of course, uh, holding court with the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this is the Ministry of Public Service, Youth and Gender. And we have Professor Margaret Kobia with us. Also, we have Jacqueline Muteri, the founder of Grace Agenda, Alan Maleche, Executive Director, Kellen. And also, we have with us Masi Shege, who is from a Plan International Director of Programming as well. But uh, just to continue with the conversation and to remind also our viewers that you can hit us on Twitter, uh, use the hashtag Nation Leadership Forum. Also, you can follow us, our Twitter handle uh, is at NTV Kenya. And also, you can follow me up also at Dibal Ayanea. Let's just continue with the conversation at pace. And I want to just come back to you. Uh, Professor Margaret Kobia, just to respond to what you had also from our panelists the, uh, this evening in regard to coordinated response as far as COVID-19 is concerned. What is your reaction? Uh, thank you, Dival. I think um, we were, the, the department were trying to reflect on what happened with the border lockdown. And I think one of the key factors to success is coordination. If, therefore, coordination is very key to getting any work done or getting any ob objective or achieved. And uh, I would like to let the viewers and the panelists know that uh, we have a gender sector working group, which has got one of the pillars is uh, gender-based violence. But I think, uh, and I do agree with the, the, the contribution that... Uh, we, are, we, we have to partner with the uh, private sector, NGOs, or civil society, because gender, domestic violence is, is a very influenced by the stereotypes, our cultures, and our values. And I can tell you, Diva, those who report domestic violence are about 50%. Most of the other cases go unreported for one reason, that uh, it has a stigma. Therefore, unless we involve more partners and the community so that in the community we make it our business to be our brother's keeper. If you hear there is domestic violence uh, in the neighborhood, I think what we have been doing in the past is kind of, uh, they'll just say leave it, it is just a domestic matter. Sometimes we even know when we would go to a police and they say if you have been um, abused, that uh, then that is a domestic matter. That is now changing, and I think that's why we need a coordinated all of society to be able to confront this uh, domestic violence. We also know, uh, Diva, that um, if we do not really know exactly what we want to achieve, like you want to reduce the cases by maybe 10%, then we'll be not be able to measure. But what I would like to say is the crisis seems to increase. And now that we know that the crisis, especially the war or conflict, can increase domestic violence, and we know domestic violence ruins families, then we also need to find where the domestic violence as occurred, what comprehensive services do we provide to the victim so that they are able to receive social justice? And what has been happening according to the registration that are existing right now in Duval, of course there is Sexual uh, Offences Act, there is Matrimonial and Property Rights Act, there is the uh, FGM, all these laws the government has brought them or policies to be able to respond to some of these ongoing domestic violence. And moving forward, as we are trying to confront and fight with the war of, of corona, I think I would like to appeal to all people to be able to know that domestic violence, much as it is also become a pandemic, as maybe the, the corona. And if we don't, in fact, if getting worse because some of the uh, domestic violence involve defilement, and sometimes you find uh, according to Evora, the lockdown, by the time a year was over, a lot of girls dropped out of school because of uh, early pregnancies. So we should also be on the lookout. What are some of those other outcomes that were very much unintended, but they might indent or erode the gains made on empowering women and girls? Right. Thank you. So a uh, critical question that maybe has come to bear as far as the pandemic is concerned and the gender-based violence is the fact that also... Uh, the government has been slow off the mark to declare protections uh, structures such, such as uh, shelter 
and safe houses and uh, services for victims of gender-based violence as essential uh, services. I don't know if, Alan, you can actually weigh in on this as well and uh, maybe just challenge also uh, the CS to, to tell us why this has been slow off the mark and it is not really an essential service as it is right now. Alan? Can't hear. Thank you, Debal. And uh, I think the issue of uh, shelters and uh, safe spaces for those who have faced uh, gender-based violence is critical. It was our expectation as civil society that in the executive order number one that was given by the president, part of the functions that would be addressed and funded would include a shelter. Unfortunately, to date, we've not had any shelter from either of the national or county governments. And even the civil society organizations that exist to provide shelters are facing challenges uh, during this COVID time to be able to do so. I think it's actually very important with the funding that we have received uh, through various sources to quickly establish shelters because you cannot keep a survivor or a victim of gender-based violence in an environment that is harmful to them. We really have to see government stepping up to be able to ensure that we have safe spaces where people can be, where they face violence uh, through this particular critical time of COVID. Right, thank you. Uh, maybe we can drop in Masi Shege, Director of Programs, Quality and Strategy, uh, Plan International on this. Uh, safe houses, uh, as, we, as we speak right now, it is not a critical essential service. It has taken a back banner in this uh, pandemic. Your reactions as well, briefly. Um, thank you so much. I think um, the safe houses wouldn't be such an essential services for such a time as now, mm -hmm. probably because, I don't know, we, we need to find a way of keeping the families together because if we start now putting people into the rescue centers, the risk of uh, you know the spread would be so much. Maybe the support that is needed more is keeping the families together. And, and, and why are we having so much violence in the families? Why are the children not as protected as they used to be? It's not that the parents don't love them as much as they did when they when the schools were open and they could go to school but i'm thinking like uh, like uh, the cs said there's this um there's a lot of disruption in the norms in the family people used to live in the morning and go different ways and meet in the evening and ask each other how was your day right now people are at home and there's nothing else to do than to watch news and get discouraged about you know the way the trends are and the fear that is there and the efforts that everybody including the government is doing so that they can keep them safe that sense of uncertainty and you know just before the covid crisis you remember we had very many issues with the with the depression with suicide and homicide and all that and this situation has only made it worse. So I think the critical thing is not just to set up the, house, the, the safe houses, mm -hmm. but try and make sure that everybody knows what they are supposed to do so that they can be able to live with each other in the COVID crisis. If families are fighting because uh, the parents or the caregivers have been laid off and there is no more food in the house, yes. what is it that the government and its partners can do to make sure that in the lockdown, and in this situation where we are having problems putting food, food on the table, everybody has food in the house. I think the biggest worry right now for every caregiver is to see the children seated around the table or around you know, the fireplace and you cannot be able to feed them. That makes the men feel like they are disabled and it makes women very desperate. And that is the source of the violence. And the children also have their own uh, issues to deal with. They know that some of their colleagues are going to school. They know that they are not going to school because they don't have the same infrastructure and that frustration can lead into misbehavior that now increases the violence. So the most important thing for me is to, to just keep spreading the message of how families can live with each other and how to handle the frustrations but more specifically can we see a lot of support that we are seeing now towards the social crisis in the family not just the medical crisis because that one is there but when people cannot feed themselves it becomes very bad so i don't know whether we should uh, we should be concentrating on um, looking at the safe houses 
or probably giving tips and making sure that uh, the radio programs, the TV programs, the messages that are going out are all towards how to cope with the current crisis, increasing the personal resilience of family members so that they can be able to live with each other. You know when the space is so crowded and you cannot move around, not very many people have very spacious houses, everybody feels so constrained, like they are not able to really be themselves and do whatever it is that they can. And let me tell you, Dubois, it is very interesting that we thought we knew how to live with our children, we thought we knew our spouses, yes, yes. but in a situation like this when we are together 24-7 for several weeks, it becomes strange that you're getting to learn their behavior and what they like and what they don't like all like you did not know them so how do we cope with this and who is there to support the families to cope with the new normal of staying as a whole family all through and you're not going anywhere and you're not sure about tomorrow thank you i don't think the issue is that the people are bad yes. and that the children are misbehaving mm -hmm. It is that we are learning to live with each other in a different way. So maybe that is the help that we should be given, the families should be given, instead of saying that we send we send children and uh, women and men who have been given to rescue centers. That would be my opinion. Right, a uh, uh, good one. I don't know if Jacqueline will hold uh, with the same uh, position that is being espoused here by, by, by just, Marcy. Let, yeah. Let, let me just answer. Yes, please. Um, uh, Master has got very noble ideas, and I'm and I'm grateful for them. And the world is filled with noble ideas, but it doesn't put food on the table, and it does not take away crises. It does not take away the fact that there's something that is going on in this country that needs to be dealt with. We're almost on week five of this uh, of the crisis of the COVID crisis. From week one, I started getting phone calls about people who are being who, a woman who was abused. Her husband came and overheard the his son begging the neighbor's child for food the mother had w w had nothing to do with that conversation but the father overheard this conversation and beat the mother mm -hmm. okay that that was scenario number one scenario number two a man in solai nakuru uh, because he could no longer do his proper border border business that was feeding his family of eight suddenly started drinking and started beating his wife do you know what the wife did she walked out she did not walk out into the sunset into, in, into, in, into the sunset holding her husband's hand. She walked out into the rain because she was fed up. She had been beaten thoroughly. thoroughly. That is somebody who needed care and support. Where do these, where do these women and where do, where do these women and all these um, uh, victims run to, if not to a safe space, to a shelter? The government does not have shelters. It does not have safe spaces. And it has never been a priority. The other day I heard um, the um, a member of parliament, Nakuru, um, went to, uh, I think she debated in parliament and said that she had come up uh, with a big bill and that she was going to come up with a safe space and a shelter and we clapped hands for her and she thought it was going to, uh, and she had separated uh, a budget for that. I'm thinking that one of the major things that some of the women reps should be doing is separating some of this money. It should have been priority number one. When we got that office of, of women rep, that is what those, those are some of the issues that should have been should have been fronted first. That the budget should have been gender sensitive, and that shelter should have been number one. Right now, communities are responding directly to to the crisis that is going on for the people that have been beaten and have been violated because there's no other structure to go to. I will help my neighbor because I live next to my neighbor. My neighbor will come to me, or I will sympathize with my neighbor. But I will not go and start looking for a home somewhere or make a, to call first of all a toll-free line that will again refer me to another place again and as i wait for this place and, and as i wait for this taxi or for for this service to come and collect me i am still living in that in, the, in that same dangerous environment and again and, and 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 then you want me to be happy with this and then live one happy family this we're in crisis mode thank you and crisis crisis mode needs crisis action and it needs fast action and there's a, an extreme need for shelters my proposition would have been <clears throat> that some of these safe spaces that could have been turned into into shelters of some sort and have government they, they we've got the lo local administration can actually come and qualify Thank a you. place that this is giving a person shelter am i talking too much no, no 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 you're not talking too much i like it i like it very but, but i'll need to take a short break uh then we continue with because we've got a lot to cover as well uh, jacqueline i like what you're raising uh very 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 candid but before we take that short break briefly let's just hear from the cabinet secretary uh so that we can wind up on the child uh, on the gender-based violence and we'll also gravitate the discussion also to child protection and also family dynamics and i like it that also uh 
Masi had also segued into that as well, uh, talking about the family dynamics and how things are changing as well. But your reaction, Professor, on this uh, shelter uh, that is not there. We've had she, Jacqueline, she's speaking very movingly on that regard. The phone calls she's getting and people have nowhere to run if they're living with an abusive husband. Okay. 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 The, okay Diva. I like her energy and passion. Uh, I think uh, when they come to safe spaces and the shelter, where the, the victims can be can, can can get some help either when they are waiting for legal redress or when they are going to go to hospital. But uh, the uh, there is no one size fits all. There are those extreme cases which might need their safe houses, and for sure there are a few women rep who have got some safe houses. I know the one in Makueni. I know at the coast also, but they are not enough. There are also safe houses I know in Kibera, the Rush of Co. Therefore, it's not like it's not like the one size fits all. Different cases will def require different in intervention, and they also remember on the family context, many mothers will not want to leave their homes and leave their children to be in a safe shelter, and they have left the, the children maybe with the the, the 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 offender. Therefore, I think we need to be careful what each case may require, and also remember that uh, there are many players in that space. There is also where you can go report to the police, and we have made, the government has already made good arrangement to have gender uh, desk where people can report uh, without really intruding into their privacy. Therefore, uh, what I would like to say is like, uh, the main cause of this gender-based violence, most of this is the, because of um, economic disruption that has come as a result of job losses. Those who are really went to earners, of course, they, are jo they have lost their jobs. Because of that, the government has already put we a will, package. We will get into that. Which we are calling social safety net. Yes, we will okay. get, we will that, get into that. And that is also supposed to address some of those reactions. Thank, Thank you. you. We will get into that. But uh, I wanted to ask you, why is it not a critical essential service as it is right now? Briefly. Why, why is it not an essential service? Yes. The self, right now, the self, you, yeah. you know, when you are dealing with a crisis, it devolves, some of the issues, may, you, you've affected them on the way. In fact, the CS Kagwe has already addressed this issue on gender-based violence because it was raised in different committees. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Margaret Kobia. We continue with the conversation at pace. We take a short break right now. When we circle back now, we will look at child protection. Of course, we know children are at home right now. And we've had also cases uh, uh, being reported of uh, children uh, being molested, uh, of child abuse, uh, or child labor as well. These are critical questions that we also will be uh, broaching with our panelists as well. Remember to drive a show with me. Hit me on Twitter. Uh, hashtag is Nation Leadership Forum. And we shall be able to sample some of the tweets that are coming through as well on the other side of a break. Don't go away. Much more on the other side of a break. Melissa? Mom, it's Dad's birthday today. I'm giving him a party just like he gives me. Nothing makes a mother more proud than seeing her child growing up. But I know that as she learns to care for others, she'll face even more germs and the risk of illnesses. That's why you need strong Dettol protection. Just one cup of Dettol protects your home and family from up to 100 illness-causing germs. Growing up needs Dettol protection. John suffers from indigestion. His twin James suffers from heartburn. Sometimes it's the other way around or both. That's why they use Gaviscon Double Action. It soothes within three minutes and lasts up to four hours. For double relief from heartburn and indigestion, Gaviscon Double Action. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. 
leo nimeka mkukukembe sharia venye utastay safe mtaani venye kama nuka na rada ni chafu Riang ya kwanza mtu wangu kunawa mikono. Hiyo ni sekunde palu after umewada hapo unatumia hiyo waba inadirizika. Namba mbekse ni social distancing. Ha lazima upigia gedhugu, lazima mwuri wako kwe 1.5 meters kutoka kwako ama kita mbekse. Rule number three, kwa uwezi kutulia kejani dunga mask. Jeshi, pamoja tukomeshe korona. The risk of illness causing jumps is increasing. It is believed that the coronavirus can remain on surfaces in your home for up to 9 days. Touching infected surfaces is one of the ways in which jumps spread. Regularly disinfect your floors, countertops and kitchen surfaces with bleach and use an effective toilet cleaner inside and outside your toilet bowl. This message is brought to you by Medifacts, Jig and Hapik. Disinfect and protect your home with JIC. JIC kills 99.9% of illness-causing germs. Disinfect floors, kitchen and bathroom surfaces and wash white clothes, towels and dishcloths with JIC bleach. Just JIC it. This is NTV. Tonight, this number is growing. 25 more confirmed cases as Isiolo joins list of counties. This brings to 18 the number of counties so far affected. Three more dead as confirmed cases tops 600. Also tonight, gunfire, water cannons, the COVID-19 standoff. We are wondering. Aiming at the heart, government urges Eastleigh and Old Town residents to heed. With a silent, silent disease like this, one can be a silent killer. Plus, learners could be out of school for a year. So what? They are at home and they are safe and they are alive. June opening date not guaranteed. And the promise of employment and economic endowment turns into nightmare hurt. Wakati nilingia kwa, kwa kiwanda cha pani pepa, nikuwa mtu wafia sana. Na nipotoka huko, kwa saizi, siwezi lima. Harufu hiyo, tena uchafu hiyo, ifumbi hiyo, hili ambayo walikuwa na shiata shiata hii shiwi nini hiyo. When you pass through Webuye, you would still feel the sulfur send around. The Webuye paper mill may have roared back to new life, but the ghosts of decades past still haunt it. When is our turn to eat? Sisi. Muna mali za lini? Well, I think. Si wali za mali yoko 100 million, 60 million ni kenda kwa administration. Na hizo administration, sasa wale maga the SU select kama leader. Some of our audience members are members, are fans of the ODM party. Thank you. Na as one of them has expressed, they miss tear gas. Wow. You know, I was a very unique kind of student. I was good in arts and I was very good in sciences. Your flexibility, ya kusomea hizo vitu zote. Si mugawie magava na wengine at least. Welcome back and thank you for your valid company or watching the 
Nation Leadership Forum. We continue with the conversation of pace. Remember, you always drive a show with me. Uh, the hashtag is Nation Leadership Forum. And also, we have uh, our Twitter handle at NTV Kenya. Also, you can follow me up at Dibal Ainer. And speaking of uh, reactions as well on social media, we have Antoinette Mide who's saying, How is encouraging people in violent situations stay together a solution until they're killed? That does not ex excuse gender-based violence. Kudos, uh, Miss Mutere. And also we have uh, Nyamogo Gogni, also still on Twitter. And he's saying, secondly, I think maybe he had given also a uh, fast uh, reaction. Absentee partner finds it a huge challenge to stay with the other partner at all times. And in absence of proper communication, a fight emerges from even a slight misunderstanding. Imbalance sharing of family responsibility responsibilities leads to gender-based violence so those are your reactions and uh, i'll be able to sample more of them as we continue with the conversation here now we want to get granular with the child protection remember we are turning our focus this evening on gender-based violence child protection and finally our family dynamics as well and i want to just drop in Marcy shege on this as well because plan international has been uh been particularly intent, especially on child welfare as it is right now. Now, Masi, a third of global population is uh, on COVID-19 lockdown and school closures have impacted more than 1.5 billion children, according to the World Health Organization. What are some of the key outstanding issues that are facing children that you're learning on the ground right now? Um, thank you, Devo. I think um, children are very affected at this time. Uh, the number of cases that have been reported by the Child Helpline 116, or the, the number of calls that they are, they are receiving are now over 100,000 per month. And they are not even able to receive more of those calls so that they can support. So that tells you that there's a lot of anxiety and that children are actually looking for help. Sometimes it's not even about abuse, it's just the anxiety, I'm not in school, my friends can't come home. You know, there's, there's just a lot of that. Children are feeling lonely, that they cannot play. And of course, like I had mentioned, they're also feeling a bit restricted. You know, there's a lot of energy in children and they need to expand it. Now, if they are only confined to their, to their houses and some of them don't have such big compounds to play, you realize that they feel like uh, they're, they're a bit isolated and depression is bound to, to kick in. Uh, we also have a lot of issues with... Uh, uh, harmful practices. We have seen on the media reported cases of child marriage and I, I know we sometimes when uh, things become so bad, families resort to marrying off their children so that they can the others can survive, which is really sad. But there have been an increase in the number of cases of um, child marriage that, that have been reported. There is also a lot of fear and we are waiting to see how that pans out when we can be able to maybe go on the ground and get some reports because FGM is on the rise. Now with the close down, there are girls who are living in fear. We work in areas where we have uh, FGM, some FGM co uh, practicing communities and there's a lot of fear that some girls may not go back to school because they have gone through FGM and they are at the, at the risk of getting married. And of course, children who are in rural areas, they know that they are online classes. There is no infrastructure for them to be on those platforms where they can go on with school. And we know that the exams will come as normal. So what is the fate of those children in the rural areas? These are the questions they are asking themselves. And children are very, very anxious. And of course, you know the way we communicate with children sometimes. We are, we are anxious as adults and we are not able to express the anxiety. So what we do is that we talk in harsh tones and when they ask us questions, we don't have those answers and even when we have the answers might sometimes you don't respond to them that only increases the anxiety in the children so those are some of the issues that children are going on of course increased violence when they watch their parents unhappy and quarreling and sometimes even witnessing fights when they watch their parents you know at home and they, they have no food for them on the table that increases their anxiety so children feel and know more than we can imagine because they are also human beings with their own feelings and at this time i can tell you that there's a lot of anxiety among the children.
a lot of anxiety among the children. And of course, a case in point, thank you, Mercy, there, is uh, what really happened in Kulamawe in Isuolo recently. And we know that a gentleman is uh, in police custody as it is right now. He walked to the police station after decimating, uh, you know, or decapitating, actually, his wife. And he walked to the police station with the son. And I just, I'm inclined to wonder how is it for the son who went through that harrowing, harrowing experience and torture, seeing the mom being decapita decapitated, and of course uh, the dad now turning out to be very violent. Maybe uh, we should just get a reaction uh, from you as well, Alan, on this. And I know you can uh, give us uh, uh, reality on the ground as far as uh, the child protection is concerned. The mental torture that comes uh, attendant with this pandemic, what will be the reaction that you have this evening? I think the issue of children is extremely critical in the terms of COVID. I think the starting point of where we have had challenges is we have not provided information to children in a friendly manner. The state has not made any effort to communicate to different populations, especially for younger children. And many may not understand the magnitude of the pandemic and need to protect themselves. I haven't witnessed any leader who has specifically addressed children. None of the press briefings has specifically spoken to the needs of children. And uh, from the case you've just talking about in Isiolo, we can clearly see that the mental well-being of children is not being taken into account. Uh, their lives have shifted dramatically, and a lot of their social contacts uh, were disrupted with only one or two days' notice. And some may even be struggling with abandonment, loneliness, isolation, and no measures have been put in place to provide psychosocial support, especially for young children. And I think we need to be aware that children are more susceptible to violence because of the stay-at-home directives. And uh, particularly in families where there are no children care alternatives, or if uh, the stress of the pandemic results in persons in the family reacting violently, the children are the ones who uh, face the brunt. So we really need to relook at our efforts around what measures have we put in place in COVID as it relates to children. So far, we haven't seen strong investment, strong messaging, and strong support to children to access all forms of healthcare services during this time of COVID. This is something we need to deeply consider and relook urgently. Right, thank you, Alan. And uh, I'll come to you now, uh, Jacqueline. The fact that we know that also urban slums are experiencing uh, the, the brunt of the pandemic as it is, social distancing is a challenge as it is. Can we talk about the children? Because uh, the children, as you've heard from Mercy, first of all, right now, it is a spawning ground for FGM. It is a spawning ground for, you know, sexual molestation. And from your experience, especially with the 2007 post-election violence, uh, children really bore the brunt of that. And uh, we had most of them also being raped and uh, the mo many of them also delivered children that uh, they are grown-ups as it is right now can you just give us the challenges that is coming from uh, the urban uh, slums in regard to child protection thank you again Dibal. um do you know grace agenda the organization was born as a response to that very situation in 2007, women were raped, and um, after they were raped, many of them unable to either get uh, alternative ways uh, conceived and, and had the children. Others tried abortions, uh, got uh, children uh, with disabilities because of botched abortions. Others gave birth to healthy children despite the attempted abortions. And those children were born and they are Kenyans today. As we speak, they are 12 years old this year. And so when those women, the, um, it happened to me. And the fact that I went through those nine months of pure torture, not knowing what I was going to do with this baby, what no, no, not, uh, uh, allow me to be frank and speak as a Kenyan, allow me to just say that it was the, one of the most horrendous and horrific times of my life. I tried three times to abort that baby, it backfired. Eventually I just had that baby and today she's with me. I cannot, um, and after I had the baby, after I had the baby, uh, it took me a bit of time to, to, to gather myself, but I must thank God for, um, um, in, in, after a while, I got a very supportive environment for my uh, members of my family. 
But that, that is after having, after having gone through a very harrowing experience. And so when I started the counseling sessions, I met with very many women and very many girls who had given birth from rapes, from, um, from, from violations, from, from the post-election violence. Some of them were gangsters, some of them militia, some of them police officers. Some of them just normal people, some of people, some of them neighbors, some of them even fathers, parents were even violating their own children and taking off. And so that's what made Grace Agenda be born, because I wanted to find out what happened. I met this particular girl who had given birth, um, who, who had a baby, and I met her at that time, her child was about three years old. That child was neglected, was abandoned, mucus running down the nose, had rashes, her hair had been cut, somebody had tried cutting it, it was, it, 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 she was just neglected. The mother was a was a drug was a, was a drug abuser was drug was, was using drugs was doing prostitution and generally didn't care for the child and uh, when I met her the very first time when we went it was at about three o'clock in the afternoon and I went and the child had been alone and had stayed in the morning the since morning alone and was given Mandazi had been left there together with food for her to fend for herself and wait for the mother until they come so the baby had just played around the whole day and I marvelled at this neglect and later on I took a walk around. And the girl told me, even this child was born from that time, even this child was born from that time. Do you see that lady? Even she was raped from that time. And I thought to myself, what's going to happen to these people? What's going to happen to these women? What's going to happen to the children? The, the, my, my heart was for the children. And I was thinking to myself, these children are growing up with neglect. They're growing up with rejection. And you know, life is such that you can only give what you have. If you have love, you will give love. If you have rejection, you will give rejection. I tell you, my friend, if you grow up with rejection, you're born in rejection, you grow up in rejection, and you're fed rejection all your life. Nobody needs to give you a gun. Nobody needs to take you to a training camp to teach you how to shoot people. You will shoot them by default. Yeah. What is happening in these communities right now is that these children are, 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 are experiencing such, such um, suffering based on also what Masih has said because of just the family dynamics, the economic dynamics within the family. And you, you're, you're unable to manage it such that this, this is just an offshoot of what is happening in, in the environment. So what do you do? Um, there's no miracle. There's no miracle to this. I happen to have um, watched a little bit of what uh, Magoha was um, responding to the parliamentary uh, committee on education today, and I said I, I said aside and prayer for him and say God help that Mr. Magoha because CS needs to be a miracle worker. They were asking hard questions of him, questions that he could not answer. They were expecting him to shoot out questions and things that he was not in control of. When you're not in control of a situation, manage what you can control. If you can't control your immediate environment, if you can't control your immediate children, do that. If you cannot call the external environment, just like Magoha said, his, his actions were dependent on what the Ministry of Health said, then he would be able to give an answer. But... Um, the, uh, but apart from that, I also want to say that um, uh, I noticed that Madam C.S. Kobda was talking a lot about uh, domestic violence. She, she rarely mentioned sexual violence, which is quite rampant of these days. Week one, when, um, the, when the COVID attack came and there was no water, in the sections of Madari, the water comes once a week. And at that water point, a very bad fight broke out. When the fight broke out, people were injured there. Uh, apparently, two women. Uh, the, the, it was a. It, it was a territory. It was something to do with territory and, and the and the water point. So um, people went back and then they came back the following day. And the, the, because there was no water and because the, the crisis had started and the, there was um, the the call to wash hands and keep your hands clean and and keep washing and keep sanitizing, they had to keep coming for the water. So the earlier you came to the water point, the earlier you were able to access the water. Mm -hmm. But what happened is that two girls were raped. Mm -hmm. Two were raped on their way within the corridors of Madare to the water point. The other two girls who were raped, were they were hijacked as they were waiting for the water because it was still dark. And then they were kept in there and they were raped for the whole weekend. The whole weekend. So now somebody like that who happens to have a child, after all that beating and the violation on your body, do you go home, you, you start, first of all, trying to recover from your own trauma, you. then managing the children, and then managing your home, and then managing the crisis, and then managing the, the, the messaging of wash your hands and keep your hands clean and, and, and observe social distance. Thank you. Please tell me, the, in this Kenya, which kind of miracle can manage that kind of work, the, the, that kind of uh, situation? Fair, Please fair. be realistic about how it is that you need to manage some of these situations. And I I'll urge Madam Kobia that one of the, 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 the main things that they should be thinking about right now is shelters as a temporary option to, to, to avoid the violations. 
and to and to and for women to seek refuge so that they come back and become much more productive people we're not saying now open a center where people i mean quarantine centers were open the government was taking care of thank them thank where you. was the money coming from right thank it could you. come from somewhere thank i mean if we're kenyans and if we're citizens and if we're valuable and if we are valued by our communities and if we're valued by our country something should be done for us thank you thank, thank you, you jacqueline and uh, of course uh, cs madam are you listening to what uh, is being raised by Jacqueline here. I think we passed that particular junction, or especially on the gender-based violence. We were just to come back to it because now we're on child protection, and you'll answer uh, what Jacqueline is raising as well. But critically, right now, uh, since we're talking about children, we know also the the closure of school, especially uh, uh, on children who are relying on feeding program. This is really affecting them right now because they were going to school, some of them, and they will know at least lunchtime, there is food available for them. But right now, that has been taken away from them. How is the government also trying to address this particular uh, gap that has been raised? Because also this uh, raises uh, critical issues of financing and feeding the children who are at home right now with the parents. Briefly. Thank you, Duval. I, 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 I do agree that with the concerns the panelists are raising because Children are also experiencing some trauma during this time of crisis. Right from those who are primary and below, they are having questions, why are they home, and maybe they have not been explained, which is difficult to explain. There are those also who are in secondary school and those who are in the university. Deval, we need to ask ourselves, during the time of crisis, government provides leadership. They will be able to look at uh, for the common good, she has already mentioned that the crisis of fighting for resources at, 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 at Madari. Mm -hmm. The government, much as we are trying to have laws and structures so that you keep uh, law and order, it becomes very difficult to provide for each and everyone. However, I think when we work together, during the time of crisis, the government, private sector, communities, all of us need to, to bring our, our to be on deck so that we can be able to start now providing solutions. Remember, this was a crisis. Nobody had planned for it. Therefore, those children who are home, they are getting experiencing a difficult time. The parents are also trying to struggle to put the food on the table, and they might not have the answers the children are asking. It is now that we should start thinking what kind of mental health program do we need for children in primary and below, those in secondary and those in the university. You have realized the government had already started using uh, digital learning for those who are able to access maybe the laptop, the TV, the mobile, but uh, about 11% were not able to access. So, so we do agree that is not equity. But I think we need to find how do we move forward, government and the community, because if we are to succeed, there need to be ownership. It is not going to be that easy, and the government always takes on board what the what is for the common good and the, in line with some planning so that we can have resources and the budget to support that. So moving forward, because we don't know how long this coronavirus is going to be with us, but we are kind of moving with responding to the situation that they are. So now, as I think my colleague C.S. Magoa said, they have to wait and sit. We don't know. He said, if the exams are to be postponed or done, Let's wait for the information. If that what might happen, you can better be able to do exam when you are alive but than to relax the measures. And then we lose so many Kenyans that even make, doing exam does not make sense. However, I'm not trying to be little that the challenges the children are experiencing, the parents are also experiencing serious problems with having the children at home. You remember the first week they were sent away, they were all taken to libraries. The libraries could not be able to cope with them because the parents were trying to find a place to keep the children. Indeed, indeed. So it is my appeal, and it is my appeal that all parents, because we have different capabilities. There are parents who are able to help their children in this digital learning. There are those who are not able. But that's why we should come together as Kenyan community and try to see can we be more societal rather than being very individualistic through churches so that we can find... Thank you. The few is 11%. How do we get them resources and equipment to be able to be 
uh, on digital learning. That's the way of the future. If you want it now or in future, we have to start moving that side. Government Thank is you. leading the way. But at the same time, it cannot be achieved at the same time because we want that equity where you are doing every effort to support, but across board. We right. may not be as fast as we, maybe the citizens ex uh, expect, but I think we, we need to flag out the challenges. Unless you understand the challenge, then you can't solve it. Thank you, it's true. Unless you understand the challenges, you cannot uh, solve it. But let me drop in as also we are trying to squeeze in time and uh, wind up. Uh, Alan, on this, because he raises the challenges of... Uh, you know, parenting at home, because this really came from the left side. No one was really expecting most of us to be working from home. And now there's a critical uh, challenge of conscience parenting, of which you, people are not prepared for it. That's why you, you can hear most of the children also are being taken to church and uh, churches as it is right now. You as a father, I know also you've been ad adversely affected by this, trying to find uh, ways of how to cope at home, work at home, and at the same time balance, you know, taking care of the children. How is it so far as a father? Uh, thanks, Debal. I think it has been a challenge, and I just want to be clear that there is the lack of clarity around education and no guidance from the Ministry of Education on how schooling will proceed has made it difficult. You have to balance between helping your children to do schoolwork. You are not a trained teacher, and I feel it's disrespectful for us to try to be teachers when you've not trained for it. I have to keep up with my work. I have to keep up with holding government accountable to do COVID the right way. And I also have to find time to be able to ensure that we spend time with our family. So the dynamics have really changed. And even though we are physically staying at home and the children are seeing us more, there's more, there's more reliable uh, stress brought in the context of you have to do a lot within a short period of time. And that's only for people like us who are lucky to be privileged to do that. But this may not apply to someone who's an informal settlement whose concern is to find food, is to find uh, access to water, access to services uh, for their family when they have to be able to stay home. So the dynamics have really changed and it actually could be a trigger for violence, for stress, and for people to try and figure out how do you deal with the mental health issues that would come around with issues concerning children. So, Dibal, it's a great shift. It's not easy. And it's something that we must really have to know how best do we get to support both parents, children. And I know the CS is talking about collective and individual responsibility. But at the end of the day, the state has a level of responsibility. There's an ability to contract and look at other experts between medical experts. We need to look at social scientists. We need to look at people who deal with behavior change to be able to get messaging that will enable us to cope with this. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, maybe just to drop in, because we have a few minutes remaining as well, menstrual hygiene, very critical, uh, Marcy, especially for the girls who could uh, easily access this uh, for, uh, uh, for free uh, at school. What has been your experience so far, especially in maybe just kitting out uh, dignity kits uh, for these children who are at home as it is, briefly? And that's also will mark as maybe your part of the Yeah, thank you, Duval. I think uh, I, in, in every situation when we have a crisis, you realize that uh, for, for some reason, girls are always the worst hit because... Uh, Talking about menstrual health management, it's very, very tricky getting the dignity kits to the girls. Uh, with the lockdown and uh, with uh, the restriction of movement in some areas, and especially when, when we work in the informal settlements, we have realized that we have to use the community mechanisms. Yes, it is working, and I think I'm really happy about that because we have a number of community volunteers. And we also have some of our girls who are above the age of 18 who have been very supportive. So we have been using the suppliers themselves. And uh, Plan International has a network of uh, community volunteers and girls, uh, girl advocates that we have worked with who are so willing to reach out to their peers. So that is what we have been doing. But one of the things that made us even start looking at how a supermarket can be contracted to deliver the pads to a certain uh, point and then um, the girls would pick them out, the volunteers would pick them from there and distribute to other girls, is one of our girls that we spoke to. 
in Kibera and we have walked a journey of three years with her and then she told us if nothing happens to change this situation I might just have got to go back to transactional sex and she has a three-year-old baby so she was asking us how do you expect me my business is now down there's no more no one coming to buy and uh, i have to stay at home we had uh, started a tibet course for her the schools are closed and she lives there alone and she has to access the bathroom where she has to pay 10 bomb per day and she doesn't have pants she doesn't have uh, water she doesn't have uh, house rent and she doesn't have food her food for her and her baby so how did we expect her to cope with that so one of the things that plan international did, did Decided to do for those girls who are in Tibet and who are doing small businesses we decided that they are the ones who are going to be mining the hand washing stations they are going to do it doing the distribution of the sanitary pads to other girls and they are going to be passing messages and our messages are packed into four education without school child protection GBV prevention and COVID prevention so we have posters we gave those girls and we, we gave them masks and we gave them gloves and we gave them uh, dust coats and they are manning the hard washing stations as they pass on the, these messages so sometimes it, it, it takes uh, a little bit more effort to make sure that uh, the girls can buy the parts for themselves and also pass that information to others and also get the parts to each other the government has a very solid community mechanism all the way to the sub chief level or to the ward administrator and i believe that the parts that were being distributed in schools should still be be distributed now through the other network Duvo, we are talking about the new normal what is the new normal for the government to take the parts all the way down to the girls who are accessing them in school thank you, thank i think there is a way and we can explore thank that you. Thank you, thank you, Mercy. Uh, indeed, of course, there's a lot that, that uh, we should have covered, but because of time, we cannot really delve deeper into them. But you've touched uh, on them, on the fam family dynamics as well here and there, and I really do appreciate also uh, your contribution uh, this evening. Unfortunately, we have to wind it uh, there, but I'll be remiss if I just don't uh, give one, uh, 30 seconds to Jacqueline also to just give her parting shows as well. Just briefly, Jacqueline. Um, uh, thank, thank you very much. My parting shot is that the... There are women who were raped during the 2007-2008 post-election violence that bore children. They have never been given any form of support or reparations, which is what we have been seeking for from the government from all that time. The president announced a justice restoration fund in 20, um, 2015. Thank you. It was re-established again last year, 2019. Thank you. May it be for the women who bore sexual violence. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, Alan, briefly, 30 seconds. Alan. Alan. Well, the state must ensure that measures to prevent, to prevent violence during this time by supporting families that require support. Additionally, they must guarantee access to post-trip care services and shelters, even during curfew hours. And the rights of the child must be protected and the best interest of the child remains paramount and important. We must ensure that the rights of the children are protected. Right, thank you. Finally, let's hear from our Cabinet Secretary, Professor Margaret Kobe as well. Your parting shot, madam, briefly. Yes, th th thank you, Deval. You know the government has already done quite a lot. We have distributed water, ta water points, disinfectants. We have also come with the tax relief as a cash transfer so that it, people are able now, instead of giving food, they are able to go and buy, including those sanitary towels. And then, of course, the COVID fad, where we are calling every Kenyan. Let's give to ones this fight. Because even if you have no money to give, you can be able to give something in kite. Therefore, what I'm uh, trying to appeal is uh, this, this war is not going to just be won by government alone. We need a partnership. And I think this discussion, we should come up with the solution that we want the government to, to take on board Thank so you. that we can work together. And the, the measures put in by the Minister of Health, they are the only the, the determinant. Thank you. If we the social distance and we do the mass, every, all those measures, I think that's what we're going to save us at the individual level. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Right, we need to wind up there. Uh, thank you for your valued uh, contribution, our panelists uh, as well. Alan Maleche, Executive Director of Kellen, we thank you uh, for your contribution. Also, uh, Marcy Shege, Director of, of Programs, Quality and Strategy Plan International. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to thank you uh, as well, uh, Jacqueline. And uh, uh, Jacqueline from uh, Grace Agenda, thank you for your valid campaign. And thank you also for contributing also on social media as well. This conversation continues on social media. I can see a lot of questions are being papered uh, for the panelists as well. Thank you for your valid campaign. My name is Dibalane. Mm -hmm.